Thank you. It's uh, terrific to be here. I'm, I'm, uh, I welcome everybody to Notes 2021. I'm, uh, and I very much appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to share uh, what uh, what I've been working on here because it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, so now I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, so this. Is gonna, do, I, do I move the slides or you'll, you'll move the slides? Does that work? Did that advance the slide? Hello? Okay. Um, all right, terrific. Thank you. Um, so again, my name is James Morales, and I have a, um, uh, my VR company is AVR Technology. I'm a virtual reality developer by trade who has recently taken an interest in graph technology by, by, by virtue of connecting with some data scientists out of Johnson Space Center. Um, special extra points, bonus points for anyone who can identify what the meaning of the graph and the AVR graph logo is. You can put that in the chat window. Some insight knowledge. Um, so, uh, an interesting quote here on the, on the subject of visualization. The greatest value of a picture is one that forces us to notice what we never expected to see by John Tukey. Uh, so, the question that I want you to uh, that occurs to me and others oftentimes is what if you can see all this in three dimensions? Um, virtual reality data analytics is a growing field. There are other companies out there that are doing this. Um, uh, a quote from Greg Nichols out at CDNet kind of sums up that uh, uh, 3D visualizations can be the right tool at the right time to help decision makers understand uh, insights from each data sets. This is from a couple of years ago on CDNet. You can see some examples there, screen captures of uh, other uh, visualization efforts. Uh, for me, um, the interest when it relates to, to uh, Neo4j particularly is in the three-dimensional topology of Neo4j graphs. Uh, this is a, a, a screen cap from a, a data scientist out of Stanford that many of you are, are familiar with, Professor Gunnar Carlson, who talks about how when you start linking nodes and relationships together um, from an unstructured mass of data, uh, you reveal a shape there, a topology of the data, and when you can visualize that in three dimensions, human beings, our, our human natural ability to recognize patterns, really um, can come into play there. Um, this is uh, a data set that I've been working on with some uh, folks out of Johnson Space Center and the Human Systems Risk Program. They are trying to understand the interrelatedness of various risks of long-duration human spaceflight. They're going to fly astronauts to Mars uh, on a nine-month trip around each way and park them there for uh, six months to a year and a half, depending on the alignment of the planets. There are a lot of risks that are, that are, that are there that we do not have to deal with years ago when we were going to the moon, when it was only two days journey. This particular um, data set that you're looking at on the screen right now is from a presentation 2016 by uh, some former colleagues of mine at KBR on the various relationships of these risks in different groupings here. And as you cycle through this visualization of medical, um, uh, other uh, renal, uh, there are two others that are coming up, uh, stability, what you see your brain begins to see that this structure is, in fact, a three-dimensional structure. As you pull these things out towards you, as different groups of these come into uh, focus, you can see that this is actually a three-dimensional structure. The problem is that it has been flattened to a two-dimensional screen. And when it becomes flattened, it becomes dense and becomes hard to see the connections and the and, uh, insights that uh, the data set can provide you. This is the same data set brought into a Neo4j graph, visualized in a Neo4j browser uh, between, uh, they're, they're right now the, the risk custodians at Johnson Space Center are, are tracking about between 20 and 30 different risks at different times. They retire some, they, they bring some forward, they consolidate others, they separate others out as they, as they grow their knowledge in the hazards associated with long duration space flight. When I model that in Neo4j, this is what I get. It becomes rather dense, it becomes a spaghetti bowl. When I model that in virtual reality, in three dimensions, and you can step inside that graph, then you can really begin to see um, interrelationships among the data. And I'll talk about some of the particulars here a little further down. Um, the, uh, 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 you'll notice um, that some, some similarities between this and the three dimensional view. In the center, you'll notice um, in-flight med. 
and you'll notice HSID. If you look in the density of the graph, it's a little bit hard to see because it's a two-dimensional view, but you can see those right there in the middle. The force-directed graph is going to bring those together because they have more relationships. So let's talk a little bit about how this, this um, uh, force-directed graph behavior um, works. Um, what I've done is I've built a force-directed graph using Unity, which is, which is one of the two major game development engines uh, that are used today to build virtual reality simulations. It's sort of like the Ford and GM of, of, of the, uh, the 3D, 3D uh, dynamic modeling world. Uh, used a lot of games, but also for training and simulation um, in, in industry. Nodes uh, are basically three-dimensional objects and they're spheres in the space. Nodes that have that are linked by relationships pulled together down to the minimum distance. Nodes that are not linked repel each other up to a maximum distance. And the Unity Physics Engine um, is what makes this happen using the Add Force. If any of you have done development in Unity, then you're, you're somewhat familiar with this. Now I have a roadmap down the, down the way to improve the physics behavior of this with some new technology that Unity is coming out with uh, called the Data Oriented Tech Stack. That will improve performance and enable me to render more nodes. At some point, though, the total energy in the system reaches an equilibrium, and the rendering stabilizes. When the rendering first appears in front of you, it sort of springs into place as the nodes push each other away and pull each other, depending on whether or not they're connected. At some point, though, all of the, the, the uh, energy stabilizes, and the and the, the uh, array in front of you uh, begins to take shape, and it's three dimensions all around you. Um, the nodes are color coded by node type. So depending on like I'll show you uh, I'll show you the, the movies database down the road and see there are two different types of nodes in the movies database. Uh, but what this does is this enables you to distinguish node types based on their color. Relationships are also color coded by the relationship label. And for visibility in three-dimensional space, as you as you saw back up in this in the two-dimensional view, when you have more than one relationship between two nodes, they have to be rendered as Bezier curves in order to be able to see them. Well, the Bezier curves are rendered in three dimensions, which makes it easy to, to tease them out and identify uh, what the relationships are between a pair of nodes. Directionality, in which uh, from and to, is indicated by the chevrons of the links themselves. So, and when, the, and when it's in the dynamic mode, the chevrons actually scroll. Now, um, uh, weighted edge graphs are also supported. So if you have a feature, uh, if you have a property in your relationship called weight, then uh, the higher, if, it, if it's uh, if the relationship value, the weight value is higher, then the, then the uh, chevrons scroll faster, and they are colored more brightly. If it's lower, then they're kind of grayed out, because they're desaturated. You have to have a relationship property named weight in order to have as a non-negative integer in order to be able to take advantage of that feature. So some interesting features about this. Uh, this is a this is still in a prototype stage, but because of the behavior of the force-directed graph, centrality is revealed by the number of relationships that a node has. So a node that has a lot of relationships with other nodes naturally groups to the loose the center of the graph. Nodes that have fewer relationships wind up getting pushed to the perimeter because more nodes are pushing them away than are pulling them towards itself. Um, nodes. Uh, when you have a highly centralized node, if you grab that node in the three-dimensional space with the controller and move it, it takes the other nodes around with it and it moves them very easily as though it's got a lot of rubber bands pulling out a lot of other things floating around. Nodes that have fewer relationships take longer to move the graph because essentially they have less influence because they have fewer relationships. Uh, if you have a node that based on their data set has no relationship with other nodes, it, uh, as an isolate node, it floats outside the main graph. It's basically pushed away by everything out to a certain distance, and nothing is pulling on it. So it, it winds up on the perimeter. This enables you to get a sense of what is what is more important based on how the graph naturally reveals itself, how it naturally arranges itself. Um, right now, the, the, uh, the demonstration enables users to down-select among the different relationship types. So, for example, I'll show you a moment on the movie graph, for example. Um, you have producer, and you have acted in, and you have reviewed, and you have directed relationships. If you down select and hide certain relationships, the graph rearranges. You can also click on nodes and 
highlight properties and nodes and relationships. You can click on a particular node and pin it in space so that it doesn't move. You can make all nodes stationary. You can hide nodes that are disconnected. Um, you can also teleport yourself around in a virtual reality space to examine the, the graph array um, from different angles. So the first thing I'm going to show is, um, and hopefully this will play, I'm going to show a, a two-dimensional a, a, a screen cap movie of the, uh, the graph in action, and it looks like it can't be found. So we're going to have to, um, we're just going to have to go through the demo here. I'll, I'll have a link to my website after that will come up. But take a look at this briefly here. This is the movie graph database that is in the, the Neo4j sandbox. The tool that I built actually connects directly to the full URL and that password and brings that graph database in from the sandbox, which means that you don't have to have a, a locally uh, installed instance of Neo4j in order to render your data in VR. You could, if you have the URL and the password and the username, you can bring it in from whatever source, whether it's um, a server instance of your own or on, on the, on the, the all, all cloud or in the Neo4j sandbox. Uh, in this particular screen cap, I'm showing how a user has teleported themselves in more closely to the movie Jerry Maguire, and they pin some particular nodes to get a better sense of that particular movie. I won't I'll mention that this link is not going to work here. No, it does not work. And what you see there is if you look, for example, on the upper left, you see Cameron Crowe has three relationships with the movie Jerry Maguire, and the directionality is indicated by the chevrons. That he, ha he is a producer, he's a writer, and a director of that film. In the lower left-hand corner, Tom Cruise with a red relationship arrow, or link, is an actor. Uh, Renee Zellweger is an actress. Jay Moore is an actor. Uh, Cuba Gooding has a, has a link pointing to Jerry Maguire, and back in Tom, Tom Cruise, his link, his note points to Jerry Maguire, plus several other movies in they have said that he is also uh, an actor in. But looking at the Cameron Cole Crow relationship, you'll notice that those links are rendered as Bezier curves, which makes them easy to see when you're in the three-dimensional space. And in this particular point in the demonstration, the user has also clicked on nodes and relationships and brought up uh, information panels that are, uh, rent, that are brought in from the database as well. The database is iterating when you connect to it, and the nodes and the relationships are created and all of the properties. Say, say again? Oh, yes, certainly. Here's a high-level view of the architecture. Um, I don't, it doesn't look like I have time to actually put the goggles on and um, give this demonstration. I would like to do that, but I, but I think I cut myself short on the time. Uh, basically, you, you, uh, you bring the data in, through uh, APOC calls, and then you're looking to render it out, and uh, eventually the architecture will be rendered uh, through the web, the browser using WebEx Live technology. And I think at that, at that point, um, I guess since um, I'm running out of time here, I'll just quickly highlight my, my bio here. Um, my, my background is in databases and in virtual reality, not in data science or graph technology. That's something that I'm new to. But the most important data point here is that I'm a history major. Um, I'll bet you I'm the only person on the panel with a large screen. And with that, I thank you for your time.